Good morning, boys and girls from Black Powder Headquarters and the Bojangles Studio, high on Sassafras Mountain. CDA presents Real Tree Radio. Welcome to a brand new, unused Saturday morning. Good morning, boys and girls from Black Powder Headquarters and the Bojangles Studio, high in the mountains of North Georgia. This is O'Neill outside. Welcome to a brand new, unused summertime summer morning or Saturday. I fouled it up again, didn't I? <laughs> oh, Lord. Welcome to the program, everyone. It's 6 after the hour, and we have an outdoor, uh, an hour of outdoors headed your way. Woman Williams is with me this morning, and uh, we've uh, uh, had uh, quite a few discussions and uh, uh, observed how many days we've been married. Welcome uh, to the program. Karen Green and Brian Green are operating the connection between WSB and the Sports Broadcast Network nationwide. We're covering 38 states, and you're listening to, and I have yet anyone to contradict, the number one live outdoor-based radio talk show in the country, and it's 27 years old now. Oh, my goodness, 27. So, welcome to the program. If you'd like to join us on the show, then the telephone numbers are 404-872-0750, 404 872 0750 in the Atlanta, Georgia area, 17 counties, and across the country at 800 WSB Talk or 800 972 8255. We have the Silent Hero Award headed your way pretty soon, and of course, the Medal of Honor tribute, and of course, your calls and fishing tips. We have a lot of calls on the line right now, and we'll be getting to every one of them as soon as I come back from this break. It's my pleasure to invite you to watch O'Neill Outside television throughout the next few weeks. And this week is a preview of the upcoming hunting season. Most of the time it's Travis Johnson hunting somewhere in Texas, but that's okay. And you can watch every week on Fox Sports Southeast, Fox Sun, Fox Phoenix, the Pursuit Channel, Centel Television, the Hunt Channel, and so many others. My goodness, it's everywhere. So tune in if you can. You can watch O'Neill outside and the upcoming hunting season, mostly Travis Johnson out there whacking deer out in Texas and turkeys and everything else. So there you go. Uh, oh, be sure in the, in the television show you watched this week, be sure and get the Swagger Tees recipe. Watch for it. This is O'Neill. I'll be back. It's 12 after the hour. This is O'Neill outside. And this time you know well, I'm a chicken fry. And if I could go beer on a Friday here, I think night. We're go right. A pair of jeans I can see good. this better. I wish I could see these better. Okay. Fishing. All right. How about that one? Uh, this is Mac for the Ram Fishing Report. Hey, you got it. I'm here, buddy. How are you? <laughs> good. The, the type is so small on the screens these days with the new software, I can't see it. So it's always a guess. How are you, Mac? I'm doing great, sir. And yourself? Good. Good. Well, we've got a good fishing report for you this week. And I hope everybody has some time off and gets out there and enjoys the lake. Um, be safe. They're going to be crowded, but uh, fish won't care, so go fishing anyway, right? Okay, you betcha. And striper fishing's been pretty good. Um, the fish are scattered out. And now, you know, I'm, we're talking about Lanier. We're talking about other area lakes, too. We're getting some really good reports from Oconee, Hartwell. Uh, the bite's on fire. I talked to my buddy Robert Edson over at Allatoon, and they're just beating them up with bait and umbrella rigs. So, overall, it's good everywhere you're fishing. Live herring on down lines. It is, it's, it's rolled into traditional summer fishing, a lot of down lines. You can use trolling to find them. Uh, look up in pockets and creeks or drains coming off the main lake. We haven't seen that pattern where the fish get out over the river channels and get really deep, at least not full on yet. That's that's coming. The water's heating up, but uh, we're not quite there yet. So think of fishing the creeks and drains that come into the major creek channels or in the river channels. We're still seeing some fish push back up over as far as a 40-foot bottom. Okay. And uh, live herring on downline or power reeling. Control to find them, and then switch over to those two things, and you should catch the fish. Just keep moving until you see them on your sonar. That's the key this time of year. All right. We had a caller in the first hour that evidently uh, 
goes to your website, and he says you've been whacking the spotted bass. Spotted bass fishing's good, and right now it's all about brush piles. Uh-huh. Uh, main lake brush, no, yeah, no surprise there. Very typical summer patterns for Lanier. If you'll just find you, and there's, there's so much brush in the lake, almost every high spot has at least one brush pile on it. And if you'll concentrate on brush that's around 25 feet, it's loaded up. And I like to start with the top water and see if I can pull them up to the top water. If that doesn't work, I kind of start working my way down, so to speak, maybe switching over to something that's subsurface, a swim bait, um, a, a fish head spin, or a steel shad, which is a big. Um, Gosh, it's a big blade bait, but things that are that you can throw out and count them down and reel it over the top of the brush. If they don't respond to any of the moving baits, then just pull right up there and get you a robo worm on a weedless wonder and drop it down the tree and hang on because he'll bite that. Okay. You won't catch as many big fish with the worm as you will with the other stuff, but if you just want to catch them, a worm, weedless wonder, 25-foot brush pile, you'll have a lot of fun. They'll be nice fish. They'll be keepers. You just won't catch as many of those great big ones. Well, you just, you just gave a terrific lesson. Uh, to the listener about the question if you're fishing a new lake or unsuccessful on the lake on which you plan to fish and or have fished in the past how a guide can help you solve that problem it's because but the, absolutely the dissertation that you just gave that is the way to fish that lake and so many others like it yeah it's pretty applicable in a lot of other places not just here Sure, absolutely. Well, you got a busy week? We do. We're going to be fishing hard. We're going to get up early and fish hard and try and get off the lake before the boat traffic and the heat beats us up. But, yeah, it's going to be a good week, and hopefully we'll catch a lot of fish. Everybody, like I said, stay safe, be courteous. There's going to be a lot of people on the lake having fun, and that's what we want. Everybody to get out there, enjoy the water, enjoy the outside, and have just a great holiday weekend. That's, it's, there's plenty of room for everybody. There is. We all just need to be patient, be courteous. It's all good. You betcha. Thanks for calling, Mac. Great report, sir. Thank you, sir. And I need to point out one thing, because a lot of guys are going to be asking me about this. We had some technical problems. Our fishing report did not go up last night. Oh. And uh, we're working on that, and hopefully it'll be up today. So I apologize, because a lot of guys, I'm, I'm flattered they like to read it before they go fishing. So we really apologize. We'll try and get it up sometime this morning. Okay. Well, the first caller this morning at uh, about 10 minutes after 4 or so, uh, was checking the report, and he enjoys it very much, and he was calling from Kentucky. Okay, well, that's great. Well, you know, we really try. It's basically an expanded version of what you hear here every Saturday morning on your show. Mm-hmm. We can elaborate more because we've got more space, but we truly try and tailor it to a guy that didn't get the fish during the week. He's getting up Saturday morning. He doesn't know where to go. At least get you confidence up and get you pointed in the right direction and give you an idea of where to start. There you go. So that's fine. good. I just, that's, I, yep, I'm, I'm flattered to hear that, so. Thanks, O'Neill. Have a great week, my friend. You too, pal. See you soon. There you go. Uh, <clears throat> let's see here. Here's uh, doggone it. 17 after the hour, 404-872-0750-800-972-8255. And here's uh, D is calling on O'Neill outside. Good morning, D. Good morning, O'Neill. How, How are you? you this morning? Just fine, thank you. What have you got headed your way today? I really hadn't decided what I'm going to do today, but uh, I wanted to tell you, when I was a kid, my dad taught me how to fish, Uh and if you caught it, you cleaned it. Uh, Absolutely. My my children and I were down at his place on Lake Wiley, and uh, I was fishing, and this gentleman on the other pier, he was holding up this catfish, y'all, and what do I do with it? And I said, well, if you bring it here, I'll show you how to take it off the hook. Uh, okay. And uh, he put it in a bucket and brought it over to, to Dad's pier, and I showed him how to take it off the hook and not get thinned. And he said, well, who taught you how to do that? I said, my dad did. And I said, now, from now on, if you want hunting catfish, you bring a rag with you so when you take it off the hook, you put that rag under the fins, uh-huh. and that way it's not going to send you. He said, yes, ma'am, I shall do that from now on. And he probably did. And he probably did. But I also want to tell you, have you ever eaten raccoon? You know, I think we had raccoon during that wild game dinner we had up here a couple of years ago. But it's okay. not, not my regular dish. My late husband used to 
get them for I don't know. I guess he would hunt them, uh-huh. and uh, he would he would barbecue them. Oh, I see. And they were absolutely delicious. They to me they tasted like a sweet beef. How about that? A barbecued raccoon. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And it was it was really good. He put it on on the grill and you know on on the charcoal and cook uh-huh. it and then uh, we'd eat it. And my daughter said, "Oh, how can you eat raccoon? That's nasty." I said, "No, it's not. It's good." No, he's a uh, he's a discriminating feeder. So uh, there's nothing nasty about a raccoon. No, they're they're very clean. Yes, they are. But I would not eat a possum. Oh well, yeah, possum. Uh, he's got a bad image. He looks like a great big rat. Well, he looks like a big old cat on on the pan when you when you bring him out of the oven too. <laughs> and I'm a cat lover, and I just I just couldn't eat one. I understand. Well, that's a great call. That's a great call, and I do appreciate it. And uh, thank you for the recommendation. We we. We have a few tomato plants up here, and uh, the, I have a little trap because the raccoons come and eat our tomatoes. Oh, okay. I used to have a dog that would eat the tomatoes. Oh, good question. Irish setter. He loved them. Wow. I had but never anyhow. Heard before. Oh, yeah. We have to remove the raccoons from uh, the locale. Thanks for calling, I, darling. I understand. You do, and you have a blessed life. You bet. So there you go. That's a nice call, wasn't it? 404 872 You had a question about deer baiting? Uh, I am not in favor of uh, deer baiting in, in Georgia on private lands. I think that takes the hunt out of the hunt. And, uh, uh, We've got a lot of deer in Georgia, a lot of deer all over the south. There's, I think this is probably in the United States or somewhere around 36 million white-tailed deer. And uh, let's hunt them, what do you say? And not, uh, we can feed them, but don't hunt over the feed. Be better he off was uh, um, wondering what was the motivation behind making it legal to start with? I don't know. Maybe we should talk about that. Right now, I need to go to a break. And when we return, we will have the silent hero description. This is O'Neill. All right. It's time. We're all set up now. Time for the silent hero account. I hope you enjoy this every day, every weekend. So here we go. Tony Jerdom, he was an, an emergency medical worker from Iowa. He was off duty. He was driving on December the 7th when a van in front of him suddenly swerved off the icy road and slid over into a pond. The cold weather had frozen the locks and the windows on the van, trapping the, the, <coughs> excuse me, the driver, Kathy Van Steendrick. Jerdom took a tire iron and smashed the van's windows, both side and the driver's side and the passenger side. A second man, Brian Ford, held on to him with a rope while he went out into the pond. Each man struggled, <clears throat> pardon me, shrugged off his hero label after pulling the lady from the van before she drowned. They both say they're just lucky idiots that jumped in first, he told CNN. No matter how cold the water was, it's this overwhelming feeling that I helped save a life. It's tremendous. They were all treated for hyperthermia, and they were fine. Off-duty emergency medical worker Tony Jerdom, and that was in Minnesota. Can't imagine. Tied a rope around himself and waded out into the pond and broke the windows on the van. And when when the 
water is that cold. I mean, you're you're just oh. you're just minutes away from Ab- being absolutely. You know, hypothermia. Oh my that goodness! That is a silent hero. Twenty-seven after the hour right now, and now let's talk to Richard in West Virginia. Good morning, Richard. Sorry, it took morning. so long. What's that? I say sorry it took so long, sir. Been busy this morning. How are you? Well, that's just the way the cookie crumbles, I guess. You bet. One thing I did here, I better keep track of this in case you have a prize package. I didn't really hear hear you say how many days you've been married. You might have that as a trivia question, so I better just mark that down in case okay, you. Okay. Uh, just in case, then, as of today, I it's nineteen thousand three hundred and fifty-four days. 19,354 days. Right. By keeping track of something like that, it sounds like it's been a struggle, but not by listening to your wife, it sure doesn't. sounds like you've been happily married for all those 19,000 days. Couldn't have been happier. What I wanted to ask about, you know, I, hear, I never listen to it. I better start. I mean, I hear him calling in, you know, Mac with the fishing report. Then I heard you talking about Kentucky. And I'm, do, I'm not sure what that fishing report is, but that'd be interesting if he did do something here in, uh, well, it wouldn't be West Virginia particularly because I'm in Wheeling, so it may make a difference between the northern part and southern part about the fishing. I don't know if he does stuff like that or not. But actually, so maybe I'll just sure pay attention to him. I just hear Mac, the fishing report, and I don't pay attention to what he's saying. But if it does relate to all parts of the country, then maybe i just better take my ears and uh, listen a little closer. But what I wanted to ask about was last week I heard you talking about, or somebody was calling talking about dough ball, and they said that they put something inside the dough ball to make it more attractive to the catfish. Because that's some, that's my goal is to catch a blue cat, but I don't know how I can go about doing it. Well, the, the best bait for a blue cat is going to be live bait. But something smelly, you can put molasses, uh, bourbon, uh, garlic, uh, anything that gives it a good strong odor. Uh, a catfish feeds and locates his food by his uh, whiskers or his barbels, and that's how he's got a flat nose, and that's how he locates the food by the smell. And so, the smellier the bait, uh, <coughs> shrimp that's been a, a little bit decayed, but the dough balls will work fine. They stay on the hook. And you can make your own. I bet if you go to the, uh, you can go to the internet, and there are a lot of companies that have especially scented baits that you can buy that catfish just love. I mean, I've used dough ball to catch catfish many times. Channel cats. Uh-huh. That's what I use them for. I, it's not smelly. It's just something I get out of the package. Uh, I used to catch them, but you're saying if you want to catch a blue cat, you've got to use live bait? What kind of live bait do you need for that? He's much more of a gamey critter, and when he gets big, blue cats do get big. Uh, I think the record's like 130 pounds. Then uh, you're, you're more likely to get a blue cat to bite that live bait than you would maybe a mud cat or a yellow cat or something of that nature. Or maybe even. Well, what kind of live bait? I mean, what we when you say live bait, what's that mean? Uh, a minnow. Or a uh, live oh, a bait. Live bait that's been cut up, cut bait that's good and smelly and more natural. Interesting. Okay, huh? uh, which I have Mac tell me where I could catch one. Well, maybe he's listening. He hey, can just check your call check your local check your local Department of Natural Resources website. I'll bet it's just loaded with information about where to get that done. Richard, glad you called, pal. We had a, remember we had a caller years ago, uh-huh. and he used to put whiskey in his uh, yes. dough balls to catch catfish. Yeah, put bourbon in there. I think he put early times. <laughs> I don't guess it really mattered to them. He said, we'd splash a little bit of that in there and then take a drink. <laughs> <laughs> they caught a lot of fish. That's right. They, and it didn't matter whether they caught any or not. 31 after the hour, 404-872-872. Zero seven fifty eight hundred nine seven two eight two five five. Let's see if I can get a name off of this thing right here. And I can't quite yet. Uh, maybe that's somebody that's just listening. Who knows? But we can talk to Black. What do you say, Black? It's thirty two after the hour. What do you say? Hey. hey. Good morning to you in 
Sister O'Neill. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd like to wish all of y'all a great Fourth of July. Well, thank you so much. Listen, talking about the raccoon, that lady from Kentucky. Uh huh. Oh man, O'Neill, you said that wouldn't you dish? Hey, we were brought up on all that wild game. Oh yeah. Hey, Blue Cat, thirty-five pounder. Ooh boy. Hey, That's a good listen one. this right quick. My, my daughter called me over about two weeks ago. I was telling Jason, uh, her husband works for Gates Rubber Company there in Lithonia, Georgia. Uh-huh. And she called me over. She and I and my sucker granddaughter, Bethany, uh, two of his friends from Gates Rubber went down to Lake Oconee and caught 42 hybrid bass. Oh, boy. And, man, I, they don't know how to clean fish. I went over there, filleted them. Uh, Bethany said, Papa, I want to get the last one. I said, well, take your chore, take your pick. And I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you 50 bucks. If you fillet that fish, I'm going to let you do it all by yourself. I said, if you leave one or two bones in there, you've lost the deal. Okay. And she took her time, old Neil, and guess what? She left two bones. Oh, said, my goodness. Law, as the Vietnamese says, you lost, but I'm going to give her $48. <laughs> and you talking about some good, old man make you slap your mama. Yeah, yeah that fresh hey, fish is tough to beat. Oh, dear, we used to catfish. Oh, Lord, I could tell you a lot of stories. Listen, I'm on, I know you got a lot to do today, this morning, so <clears throat> I hope... Ms. O'Neill is doing great. I got my package for the soil test. Oh, good. I'm going to soil test on my soil here. Oh, got yeah, Got two good. big old trees, three big trees to cut down this morning. Uh-huh. And listen, 19,500, you got me beat just a little bit. 51 years come 26 August. I'll be darned. With That's the good. same woman. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. Take care, O'Neill. God bless you. <laughs> Glad you called back. Black, it's always good to hear from you, pal. 404 872 Gail is man in managing the connection with uh, uh, Facebook this morning at O'Neill Outside. What do you got going on over there? Um, well, finally got <clears throat> to where I can actually answer. I had to get okay. the iPad out. But... Uh, Carl Matthews said on the bait fish that uh-huh. you were talking to the guy from West Virginia, mm-hmm. w- wouldn't it be best to try and catch the species of bait fish in the area where you are fishing? That's right. Match Sounds the reasonable. hatch. Yes. It's called what? Match the hatch. Aha, uh-huh. okay. Whether it's the size or the color, that's why when we're in Canada for northern pike at walleye, we use things that are either gold or yellow or red because mm-hmm. that's most of the fish feed on the yellow perch. Mm-hmm. Okay. Match the hatch. That's all I've got right now. Okay. Well, that's interesting. 19,354 days as of today. We're not ever going to use that for a question. Uh, and I'm not going to. That's not going to be next <laughs> week's. That is not going to be no. next week's uh, radio pi- prize package question. No. That radio prize package is getting huge. That must be a big box of yeah, stuff. Yeah, we're going to take a whole segment to read it off. Yeah, all the baggage. Of course, you always tell me I could do it faster. Well, that's okay. Well, it might as well be. do it faster. This is a two-hour show. <laughs> when, uh, we just got a few seconds here, and then when we return, one of the high points of the program is the description for the Medal of Honor. And uh, you can go to O'NeillOutside.com. Uh, you can, <clears throat> for fire aid and for the Southern Grind Knives, but you can or write on a medallion there, and you can read about the recipients for the Medal of Honor. And we'll do that when we get back. Welcome back. It's time now for a treasured moment in the program. It's called the Medal of Honor Tribute.
Senior Chief Britt Slabinski, U.S. Navy, Afghanistan, 2002. Senior Chief Slabinski had le was leading a reconnaissance team to its assigned area atop a 10,000-foot snow-covered mountain. Their helicopter was suddenly riddled with rocket-propelled grenades and small arms fire. The crippled helicopter lurched violently and ejected one teammate onto the mountain before the pilots were forced to crash land in the valley far below. Slabinski rallied his five remaining team members for an assault to rescue their teammate. The team came under fire from three directions. Without regard for his own personal safety, Slabinski charged directly toward the enemy fire and assaulted and cleared the first bunker he encountered. The enemy then unleashed a hail of ma machine gun fire from a second position only 20 yards away. Slopinski repeatedly exposed himself to the, the deadly fire to personally engage the second enemy bunker and orient his team's fire in the furious close quarters firefight. Proximity made the air support impossible, and after several teammates became casualties, the situation became untenable. Slabinski maneuvered his team to a more defensible de position, directed airstrikes in very close to his team's position, and requested reinforcements. This was overnight now. As daylight approached, accurate enemy mortar fire forced the team further down the sheer mountainside. Slabinski carried a seriously wounded teammate through the deep snow. And so, throughout the next 14 hours, Slabinski stabilized the casualties and continued the fight against the enemy until the hill was secured and his team was extracted. Senior Chief Slabinski reflected great credit upon himself and upheld the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. He died May the 24th, 2018. This was a uh, World War II? Uh, Afghanistan. Af oh, Afghanistan. Oh. Well. Gracious. 43 after the hour. 404-872-0758-9-8255. That is certainly one of the high points of the second hour of the outdoor show every week. That, that being the Medal of Honor tribute. And you can find those descriptions by visiting O'Neill outside. And right there on the home page, you'll see a medallion that says the Medal of Honor tributes uh, and descriptions. And it gives, gives you them all. And uh, I guess we've been doing that for probably five, six, seven years now, wouldn't you think? I don't think it's been that long. You don't think it's been uh, that long? Maybe three years, something like that, yeah. Okay, a lot of them. It's been a lot, yes. Yeah, a lot, a lot of World War II guys that, uh, uh, I think the World War II guys are dying now at about 1,500 a day or more. Yeah, uh, they did a Medal of Honor this week, I believe, at the White House for uh, to a widow. Yes. Uh, there was something special about that. He though. had received the, I don't remember his name, I should. He had received the uh, Distinguished Service Cross, and his wife had always thought that if you looked harder at the situation and the descriptions by the personnel involved, that he should have received the Medal of Honor. And a congressman, which goes unnamed, I don't remember, uh, had some research done mm -hmm. as to the description of what happened that day, and he was awarded the medal. Ah, oh, that's wow. wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. And, of course, a little background on that. I've said it so many times. I hope you don't mind. Uh, this came about because, or we started this because it was a few years ago that uh, uh, a very popular entertainer died of a drug overdose, and she drowned in her bathtub. 
and the state in which she lived or was born put their flags at half staff. And quite frankly, uh, that made me mad. Here you are giving a half staff tribute to a druggie that drowned in her bathtub. Yet these heroes, nobody knows their names. And I wasn't going to put up with it. Yeah. Well, you didn't. You did no. a good thing. You yeah. did a good thing. So. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. What is the size of the strike zone area for bass? What is the size of the strike zone area, area? for bass? Well, he's uh, a, a largemouth bass is what we're talking about. He's a pretty lazy critter. Uh, he doesn't swim around much. He doesn't migrate much. If he can stay in the same water temperature with some cover and some reasonable baits close by, most of the time, a largemouth bass travels just up and down. He doesn't travel side to side, so he just follows the water temperatures up and down in the column. That's what he does. And he can, see, so he doesn't go far. So what's his strike zone? Usually about three feet around him. And what he does is, uh, here's a lesson for you, a largemouth bass has a big mouth. And when, he gets, when he's going to eat a, uh, a, a, a smaller bait, a, another fish, a worm, or what kind of bait are you using, he flares his gills and sucks in the bait, sucks in whatever he's trying to eat. So he doesn't go far. Uh, so it's close by. That's how he feeds. Uh, a largemouth bass is not very migratory. Uh, a migratory fish is called a pelagic and that's a lot of saltwater stuff, most of the pelagics. But you have to remember in reservoirs all over the country with stripers, that striper migrates. He goes upstream uh, into the feeder creeks and feeder rivers every year in an effort to spawn. So he's predictable to go up there. And so that pelagic species, you know, most saltwater uh other than reef fish, most pelagics will travel fabulous distances uh, over the courses of their lives. And uh, isn't it funny that one of the one of the uh, most uh, greatest distance traveler in the uh, in the ocean is almost one of the slowest. It's a turtle. And sometimes he will not feed for his entire journey, thousands of miles. And, of course, too, the whale, the humpback, uh, he's, the humpback spends the birthing season in Hawaii and down into the coast of California along the Baja. And when the calf is raised and can travel, they travel, they, they swim all the way back to the Arctic to feed on krill and they do not, do not eat during that entire journey, which is thousands of miles. Nature. Yeah. And all of this just happened. Yeah. It's uh, all just big boom. That's right. And still, in it, I'm about to go out of here. No, I'm not. Uh, still, the largest mammal ever definitively that we definitively knew or know of that's ever lived on earth still lives on earth. That's the blue whale. That's bigger than the dinosaurs. That's bigger than any other mammal that's ever lived on this planet. Where are they located primarily? Uh, in the Pacific. In the Pacific. In the Pacific, that's right. Interesting, isn't it? I know yes. I was reading something the other day about uh, uh, some fossil finds in the Arctic, and they found some some mammoths and other creatures that had uh, fallen and were frozen rather quickly, and they found, this is in the Arctic now, and they found vegetation in their stomachs, which easily considered then that the Arctic was once a garden. And it got cold 
it got warm, it got cold, and it got warm, and the earth had been frozen three times at least, and there wasn't a single oil well, there wasn't a single car, there wasn't a single coal plant, nothing. It just happens. Yes, you have something there? Uh, yes, let's answer this again. We've addressed it, but it, it's uh, something that concerns people. Okay. Uh, did y'all give your opinion on the new bait law for deer? The bait law? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I am personally disappointed in that. I think that t that rem that's <sighs> that to me that changes deer hunting into deer shooting. It changes the feeding patterns for white-tailed deer. It makes it too easy. It's target shooting and not hunting any longer. In other words, you don't need to find the bedding areas or the travel routes or determine the uh, uh, those things about the white-tailed deer to know where he lives, how far he travels, and so forth. All you have to do is go out and hunt over the corn pile. I'm not for that. I don't know what the upside was. We have a lot of deer in Georgia. I think somewhere in the territory of 1.2 million prior to the season, and about 300,000 or so are harvested every year. Uh, it's a big money maker with licenses, tags, uh, permits, and so forth. But that's, you know, and you pay an excise tax. We are the, the uh, we pay for conservation, the hunter and fisherman does, in the products that he buys with the excise taxes, the license fees and permits, whether it's for ducks or deer or whatever. Uh, I personally am not in favor of the uh, baiting for deer, but still, don't be confused. You still can't bait deer on wildlife management areas, only private property. Yes. I didn't realize that. Uh huh. You, you can't go. Uh, Gail yeah, and I, I guess live not. Uh, yeah. close. We live next to the Dawson Forest, which is a wildlife management area. I think it's in the territory of about 20,000 acres next to us here. Our little lot joins the, the WMA. And. Uh, we, uh, and that, that's, you can hunt there under permit, of course, uh, b and foot traffic only, but you can't bait there. You can't put out corn and bait and things of that nature there. You can on private property close by, but not there. That makes sense. Yes, it does. Yeah. Absolutely. So what they did was they changed the southern, you could bait in the southern zone for years in Georgia. Now they just extended the line, the southern zone, to enjoy, in, enjoy North Georgia. So wherever it is you live, okay, just pay attention to the law. Uh, just because it says you can bait doesn't mean that you have to bait. You follow? Okay, we'll be back. It's 54 after the hour. And it's 57 after the hour, we've got one more caller here we want to get to. Hold on quite a while. It's uh, Alan calling on O'Neill outside. Good morning, Alan. Good morning. How you doing? Lovely. Man, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the Medal of Honor thing that you do every week. You're I'm a long-time well. listener, and I look forward to that on my way fishing every week. Thank you. I mean, that's just, you know, those are our true heroes, like you say. That, you know, the other people, you know, whatever. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I'm a soft-hearted guy, and I have to read this several times and become acquainted with it, or I'll never get through the reading of it. I'm sure you do. Yeah, I know. I, you know, I kind of tear up too, and I hear them. Yeah. Anyway, those are true heroes. You but, bet. Uh, so I'm headed to uh, Etowah River to do some big striper fishing. Oh boy. And. uh I'm gonna. I've got a cast net. I'm gonna catch some shad and uh, fish. I think that'll be the best way to go. Yes. But uh, what is some good artificial bait for uh, catch a striper? Some just uh, some kind of a swim bait. Uh, you know, uh, a a, sh a shad swim bait. I would tell you that uh, one big hook would work better than a crank bait with a lot of small hooks. Gotcha. But a swim bait, just matching the hatch, 
I mean, if you can make right. something that looks and smells and swims like a shad, then all the better. Gotcha. Good luck to you. Well, the the, the Etowah is full of stripers. Yeah, it is. They swim uh, up from got the line coast, don't a couple they? of times last week. Uh huh. Fantastic. Uh, Fantastic. Anyway, man, I appreciate you. Been listening to you for years. First time I've called, uh, you know. And uh, like I say, most of my fishing buddies know me as Tartar Sauce. Because <laughs> when I go fishing, I bring Tartar Sauce with me. <laughs> Good for you. Have a great holiday <laughs> and a great weekend, pal. Thanks, buddy. You're a great American. You bet. See you soon. All right, this is O'Neill. Another uh, two hours of outdoors we've covered. We hope you've enjoyed it, and you make plans to join us every week. So thanks to Karen and Brian Green, Woman Williams, Jason Byers, and you keep this in mind, whatever you do, whatever you go. It's a holiday weekend. If you're too busy to go fishing and take a kid along, you're too busy. And we'll see you guys next Saturday morning. 